I mean, Godspeed to me, because I have never even done brioche before, cabling my first brioche. It, it sounds like something I would do, honestly. Hi, hello, my name is Allie, and this is my channel where I talk about what I'm knitting, how it's going, and what it's costing me. I'm an independent graphic designer coming to you from just outside Toronto today with my Tinkerbell mug because she's a personal favorite Disney character of mine, and also because Disney makes a good mug. In this month today, I'm drinking my budget tea, which is the Ahmed tea Earl Grey, and the fact that I'm drinking budget tea today, good for me, because <laughs> this is relevant to what we're going to be talking about today, which is fall knitting plans. And I have spent some money preparing for some fall knitting plans on some yarn and I should be saving money where I can right now. All right, so like I said, today we're going to be talking fall knitting plans. And then hopefully we'll have time today to do an off the needle segment at the end where I can tell you a bit about books I've been reading, TBD. But if I haven't cut this out, you know more than I do because that means that it is in fact coming. Today I'm wearing my squiggle sweater, which is sort of a self-drafted weird project that you can read about more on my Ravelry project page because this one happened before I had my channel. But in brief, I made my own chart to try to dupe a sweater from and other stories and I used for the base of that an Amy Herzog pattern. I believe it's the basic pullover set in construction. So if you want to see more about that, pop over to my Ravelry. Oh, here he's come to show you his ball that he's throwing around. Hello, my love. Do you, do you think we could do that another time? So when I'm revisiting an old knit on the channel, I love to take that as an opportunity to look back on the cost of the project and how its current cost per wear is shaking out based on how it's actually working out in my life. So this was not a cheap project. There were a lot of complications with it. There was a lot of expensive yarn stuff going on. And in total, it cost me $222.50 Canadian, which is so much money for a sweater. But it has now been over a year since I finished this. And in that time, I've worn the sweater 29 times, which if you're wondering how I know this, I use an app called Stylebook and I track what I wear precisely so I can have this kind of nerdy data. And that means that we are currently at a cost per wear of $7.67, which is still high for a garment, but you know what? It's only been a year. The fact that we're already up to 29 times makes me feel pretty good. We're only heading into this garment's second fall winter season. So you know what? I have high hopes for it. I think this has a good chance of reaching a reasonable cost per wear in its future. Also for reference, those numbers are about $163 US in total or about $565 per wear. Okay, so just like when I did my summer knitting plans, I divided today's plans into concrete plans. So things that I'm like pretty confident I'm going to actually end up doing and then maybes. So like I might possibly get around to this if I get through all my concrete plans or if something weird really like changes my concrete plans. And then we have a category that's really just inspiration. Like it's not very likely to me that I'm actually going to end up knitting any of these, but they're pretty and they got me thinking about fall knitting plans and maybe you'll knit them, maybe you just also want to look at them with me, but we're gonna look at them nevertheless. And Copper's letting us know that his life is really hard. Before we get into fall knitting plans though, let's chat a little bit about how my summer knitting plans went. So first of all, I did not post that video very long ago. I think there are only two videos on my channel in between <laughs> the summer knitting plans and when this one is gonna go up. And that is because I was very late to posting my summer knitting plans. It didn't even like occur to me as a thing to make any sooner because I was just so down the rabbit hole of my giant cardigan that I was knitting forever. But I was like, what do you mean plans? Like, I'm not planning anything. Like, this is just what I'm doing for the foreseeable future. <laughs> so when I finally finished that, I was like, oh, I can finally fathom some plans now. And um, it just happened that that was like halfway through the summer. So here we are, only a few weeks later, already talking about fall knitting plans. But you know what? As much as my summer knitting plans were belated, I feel like they really checked out because the concrete plans that I said that I had in that video were my Tecla top, which is now complete and you have seen, my Fausta top, which you have seen as a whip and is getting very close to being done. I'm pretty confident that's going to be a finished object in my next video. And a little hint to what you're gonna see in that video, I have also cast on for my Sailor Swift top. So that one is far from done at this point, but it is underway. And I mean, I haven't abandoned a knitting project yet, knock on wood. So it looks like that one's happening too. So that's three for three on my concrete summer knitting plans. And let's see how my fall ones look by comparison. Now, I do think there's kind of an interesting thing here where summer knits just tend to be faster projects because they're smaller garments. So looking at these fall knitting plans, I also only have three items on my concrete plans, but those three look quite a bit more ambitious than the three I had on my summer knitting plans list. Now, granted, I only had half the summer for those summer knitting plans, but I don't know. I'm looking at these fall knitting plans thinking, is this ambitious? I don't know. I mean, the good news is that I think that there's definitely more room for crossover between fall and winter knitting than between summer and fall. Like it's not like January is going to come and I'm going to be like, God, I wish I wasn't knitting these wool sweaters anymore. You know, like that's just not, that's just not gonna happen. So if this kind of melds into a fall slash winter knitting plan situation, 
that'll be fine. I hope that there's a bit more delineation than that just because, I mean, I think that it's really fun to do seasonal knitting plan videos and if my winter knitting plans video would just be telling you about all the same patterns I'm telling you about now, I don't think that's very fun. But I love watching those videos so I'm really hoping to be able to make one of those for you guys as well. So I guess that means I better get knitting. So let's look at first my concrete plans for fall knitting. All right, so first off, I am apparently feeling like a very generous sister this year because here's the situation. So I started knitting good two and a half years ago at this point. And when I started knitting, my sister thought this was hilarious. This is perfectly on track with, we're, we're very similar in a lot of ways, but the ways in which we're different are primarily that like I am a giant nerd and she's not. So me taking up knitting was a very like classic alley, deeply uncool thing to do. And now to be clear, I don't mean that as a shot at myself. All of my favorite people are deeply uncool. But suffice to say, it gave my sister new material to rib me for. Now cut to about six months later and she starts to see the things that I'm knitting. And oh, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting that some of them are cute? Isn't that interesting that they're not exactly what she pictured when she heard knitting? Isn't it interesting that they're not just like dated things from the 80s? Like, oh, interesting concept, they're cute. And when she know it, shortly after that, she starts dropping hints of, oh, well, you know, it would be nice if you knit me a sweater. Do you think, would you ever knit me a sweater? It would be really nice if you knit me a sweater. If you knit me a sweater, could it be? So that has been the last little while. And for a long time, my line was, you made fun of me for knitting. I'm not knitting you anything. But you know what? She's been on her best behavior for the last while. I think she's still really angling for a sweater. And I'm like, okay, you do a lot of things for me. Basically, most of the time that I go on a trip, it has been planned by my sister and I just show up, which like, as an extremely type A organizing person who normally gets stuck with all that kind of stuff in every other thing in life is a very nice way to get to travel and get to let go of all of that. So I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe this is the Christmas that you get a sweater. And now you might think that it would be logical once I've made that decision to pick a pattern that would not be an enormous undertaking to make for someone else, right? Pick something at a bit of a bigger gauge, pick something simpler, something I can crank out relatively quickly. But here's the problem. Once I've committed my brain to an idea, I wanna do the best possible version of that idea. So I don't just want to knit my sister a sweater, I want to make her a really beautiful garment. And that's how I have landed on, and we will see how my future self feels about this decision, the Minu cardigan. This is not gonna be a simple project. So I started by asking my sister, would you rather have a pullover or a cardigan? She picked cardigan. I then gave little tiny thumbnail pictures just of close up texture asking, would you like plain stockinette, brioche or some other sort of simple texture or like a cabled seriously textured garment? And bless her, she was like, oh, I'm sure any of them would be beautiful, but I do really love the cabled one. And I'm like, go big or go home, we're making a cabled cardigan. My next and final question was, would you like it to be a neutral color that will kind of go with anything or would you like it to be a fun pop color? And she said, surprise me. So this one is a concrete enough plan that I actually have yarn for it, but before I show you what I'm going to be knitting it out of, let's quickly run through the project stats. So this is the Minu Cardigan by Louisa Rekop. It costs 650 euros or about $10 Canadian, and depending on how much of the recommended positive ease that you want, it fits anywhere from a 58 to a 62 inch bust. So this cardigan is a top-down seamless construction, so you start by knitting the back, then you pick up to do the two front panels, and then you join under the arms. And because it's a cardigan and it's not steaked, this is one that I will be knitting flat the whole time. And have I ever done cables knitting flat? Yes, actually, yes. My first cabled experience was my cabled headband. So that would have been knitting flat. I'm hoping that the cabled rows only occur on knit rows. I feel like that's usually how they're structured. So fingers crossed. Fingers crossed this is a repeat that is relatively easy to memorize. I don't actually know this yet. I've not gotten that far, <laughs> but it looks stunning. Like I just, I'm also not entirely clear. I haven't purchased the pattern yet, but I remember seeing something in either the description of this or maybe someone else's project notes alluding to brioche being involved. So maybe this isn't just stockinette with cables, but it might in fact be brioche with cables, which if that is the case, um, I mean, Godspeed to me because I have never even done brioche before. So if I'm cabling my first brioche, I mean, it, it sounds like something I would do, honestly. So none of my knitting friends will be surprised by this life choice. The only question is how much I hate myself for this life choice a couple months from now. But right now, when I'm not actually working on it or having to figure out any of these things, I'm really excited about this because I just think it's going to be stunning. I feel like if I'm going to make a garment for someone else, I don't want it to just be some like boring thing that's gonna get stuck at the back of their closet. I kind of want it to be like a showstopper that you're excited to pull out of your closet. And I think that that's exactly what this kind of pattern is. So along that line of thinking, as far as neutral versus fun color, 
I think you can see where this is going, particularly if you've been here before and you are familiar with the kind of things I knit. I mean, this being a case in point, I don't tend to knit a lot of neutrals. All right, we have a giant stash of yarn. Conveniently to knit this, I needed 10 balls and that is how they come packaged. So they're currently in this nice unopened bag. That's gonna make a lot of crinkly sounds. So for this project and picking the yarn, this was kind of a different set of considerations than I would use in knitting something for myself because my sister is not a knitter. She's not a person who is used to hand washing her garment. She also has two kids and runs her own business. Like she just, she is busy. She does not have the time for these things. And I also do not have the time to quietly resent her for shrinking something that I spent a hundred hours knitting for her. So with all that in mind, I picked Superwash. So this is the Cascade 220 Superwash. And as you can see, I picked it in this really fun, bright color. This is called Deep Sea Coral, I believe. The yarn belt doesn't actually have a name on it, but it is color number 287, which I believe is called Deep Sea Coral. And I'm really excited about this color because Kim loves the color pink. And I think this is a nice, really vibrant color that's dark enough that it will give some nice contrast against her equally pale skin tone. Like I think that this cardigan would look stunning in like a blush or baby pink color on its own, but then put it on us and it looks terrible. So I think that this will be really nice as far as providing good contrast and also just being a really fun, vibrant statement piece to wear. So if you're unfamiliar with Cascade 220, it is a 100% wool yarn and it comes in a bunch of different variations but so I just got the 220 superwash version there's also a 220 merino version I believe there's also a bunch of different weight versions as well but this one is listed as I believe it's sort of on the cusp between DK and worsted I think this pattern wants a DK it's written to be knit with a fingering weight held double with a mohair which is usually about a DK weight so it's possible that this yarn is a bit thicker than what the pattern is expecting but my gauge is also always tighter than the pattern is expecting so I need to do some swatching. It might be that I can knit this with the needles that the pattern's written for, because I usually size up and just the yarn will make enough of a difference. It may be that I need to do both. It may be that I have more of a problem. And it might be that I have to knit a size smaller to end up at the size I actually want to if my gauge ends up being big. So we'll see how that works out. Step one is gonna be knitting a swatch for this one. Now, because I already have the yarn for this, we can actually talk numbers for this one. So I ordered this online from Le Laine Biscuit, which is a Canadian yarn store. And I think it was the only place where I found this much of this color in stock. Now, fortunately, I had to buy enough of this that I got free shipping. So my total was $152 Canadian. Or once you add in the pattern cost, that brings the total project cost to $163 Canadian or about 119 US, which this is where gift knitting gets tough because like I might spend that much on my sister's Christmas present in a normal year, but that would be kind of the top end of the range I would ever spend. But now I've spent that and I'm so far from having her present ready. <laughs> like, now I've spent more money than usual and I have so much work to do. <laughs> Why am I doing this? So this is gonna be one of those strange things where like, I guess just some years, someone in my family is just gonna get a much better Christmas present than everyone else. Cause I can't match this. I can't make everyone a sweater every year. So I think everyone else just has to be okay with it being Kim's year this year. And maybe it'll be your year another year. So that is the first concrete knitting plan of the fall. That is the Minu cardigan for my sister. Now, is this actually going to be the first thing that I cast on this fall? I'm not sure. The next one that I'm gonna talk about is kind of vying for the next project slot against the Minu cardigan. And I'm trying to determine, do I want to knit her cardigan first so that it is done with plenty of time before Christmas and I don't have to worry about it and it's not a rush and there's not a stress? Or do I want to knit the next one first because it is for me and if it is for me, would I rather have it for more of the fall slash winter season than I will if I wait to knit it until after Kim's is done. Do you know what I mean? Like Kim's cardigan sitting here like all November and all December if it's done already doesn't really help anyone. So I'm not really sure which way I'm gonna go on that. Maybe I'll just swatch both and see what I feel like. Maybe I will just arbitrarily pick one one day. TBD. So that second contender for the next project slot is the Colette Pullover by Sari Nordland. Now I haven't knit a Sari Nordland pattern in a long time, but I have knit one. I knit her, I believe it's called the Sunday Socks pattern. If not, I will pop up what it is here, but it is a pair of cabled socks that I knit a couple years ago. And I just have several of her patterns floating around in my favorites, but I haven't knit any more since then. And we might be noticing a bit of a theme in these fall knitting plans because these first two involve cables. And Oh, I am such a sucker for a cable knit. Like I just find them so stunning, but I also know that they're a lot of work, right? Like I love watching them knit up, but every time I get to the actual cabling row of the pattern, I'm like, ugh, it's a cabling row, <laughs> you know? Like I'm not like excited to do the actual cabling part, but I am really excited to knit the like two or three rows after the cable row where you start to really see it take shape. 
So I think I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with cables in that way, but I really am feeling like a sucker for them this fall. So this is the cable project that would be for me. And one of the things that stuck out to me about this pattern is that I feel like it is one that could actually work well as sort of a transitional weather sweater. So the pattern is shown, I believe, in a fingering weight held double with a mohair. But I was thinking, what if I knit this out of a cotton or some other sort of more warm weather appropriate fiber to have a sweater that I can wear without it being minus 10 outside? Because I love all of my sweaters that I've knit so much, but I do sometimes have the problem where I'm like, oh yeah, it's cold enough to wear this today. And I put it on, I'm comfortable for a couple hours, but then it warms up throughout the day and I'm like, it's not cold enough to be wearing this. I am sweating. So I like the idea of having a sweater that I think is equally beautiful, but that serves me better during the more transitional weather. I could also wear on summer evenings. I think it would just be nice to have something that's a little cooler than my beloved 100% wool. And looking at this pattern, it feels well suited for that. Like with the little eyelets, like it just feels like this does not have to be a sweater that's going to keep me warm when it's minus a million outside. So with that in mind, I was thinking back to when I was at Knit City in Toronto earlier this year and the Wandering Flock announced their new base called Cotton Lino. And it was gorgeous like it was just so soft and nice feeling it did not feel any bit like scratchy it did not feel like most plant-based fibers that i've encountered it felt like you could trick me into thinking this was all animal fiber but it actually has a composition that is very hospitable to warm or sort of transitional temperatures so it's 35 percent organic cotton 30 percent mulberry silk 20 percent linen and then 15 percent alpaca for that little bit of softness and it's just lovely and okay does it really help that while the color collection is currently very small, it includes a shade that is just the absolute perfect iteration of a color that I've been wanting to knit for for a while now. Yes. So I'm going to be knitting this out of the Wandering Flock Cotton Lino in the color Citrine. Look at it. I have been wanting to knit something in a citrine green for at least a year now. I think it was having a moment where it was very trendy for a bit and I think that's kind of subsided now, but I just adore it. It's just such a kind of unusual color. It's actually very similar to the color that I painted my bedroom as a teenager. <laughs> so between the fact that they had the absolute perfect color and the fact that I'm very interested in trying out this base for a sweater that works better for the fall months, it just seemed like a no-brainer that this was the time to try it out. So I have in fact actually ordered this yarn, it's just not here yet. But so for reference, it cost me $134 Canadian for three skeins plus shipping. Now I think when I checked yardage that I was estimating that I would need about two and a half skeins of this, so I should have a decent amount left over, including the cost of the pattern, which is 690 euros or about $11 Canadian. That works out to be a total project cost of 145 Canadian or about 106 US. I am just, I'm just really excited with the prospect of this one. I could see it's possible that when the Cotton arrives, I will just be too obsessed with it to not cast this one on first. I'm just so curious to try this new base. I've knit with a Cascade 220 before, so I might just be tempted from the novelty of it all to cast this on. And the color, it's just, it's just such a good color. So as far as the pattern itself, this is a DK weight knit and it is a drop shoulder construction. So you start knitting the back and then you pick up for the front two panels and then you join under the arms to knit in the round from there. And I haven't actually done a drop shoulder construction before. I feel like they've become very popular in the last year or so. I don't think that I was hearing a lot about them before that, but I feel like they have just taken over the knitting podcast space in the last year. I feel like maybe there was a trend for a while of just top down seamless in the round, like yoke sweaters were very popular because I mean, I think most people don't like the assembly stage of knitting something in pieces. So for a while it was just like absolute most simple construction that could be done in the round. And then I think people just kind of started to wish for a little more structure in the shoulder area. And the drop shoulder construction has sort of entered the scene as a sort of compromise <laughs> where we're getting a lot of the structure of a seamed garment without having to do actual seaming. But you do have to like pick up stitches along the way. Like it's just, it's not quite as seamless an experience, even if it is literally a seamless garment. But I am interested to try it out as sort of a compromise construction situation because this was knit in pieces and let me tell you i did not enjoy assembling them at the end <laughs> okay next up on the concrete plans list i want to make christmas stockings i've been thinking this for a while now and if i'm gonna have them done for this year i need to get working on them but i just think that it'd be really nice to make my own christmas stocking and preferably make a pair of them so i can sort of like display them maybe on either side of my tv or something leading up to christmas and then just take it with me when i go visit family to celebrate christmas now have i knit a christmas stocking before no but i have knit socks so i figure i'm just knitting like a really big sock so it shouldn't be all that unfamiliar to me. I do need to figure out though what I'm knitting this out of. So the pattern that I've settled on is just called Christmas Stocking by Claire Slade. And this is a free pattern, so that's always fun. Now it is written for a bulky weight yarn, so I need to figure out what I'm going to be making this out of. I also need to figure out what color I would like it to be. Do I want it to just be like a nice white cream kind of color? 
is that just gonna get dingy over the years? Because this is something that I will be hoping to use every year for a very, very long time. So should I knit it in something that will disguise that a little more? I'm not sure. I need to figure that part out still. But since it is effectively just a sock in terms of the toe up slash cuff down of it all, these are knit cuff down, which I think is the only way I've ever knit a sock. I think that's true. So this one shouldn't be a giant learning experience so much as it will just be a funny exercise in knitting a giant version of something I've knit several times before. Also, um, yeah, more cables. I might be really tired of cables by the end of this fall. So if I abandon my concrete plans list, that will be why. It will be because of a surplus of cables. But I would really like to not abandon this one because I really want a Christmas stocking. And also it's bulky weight, so it shouldn't take too, too long to knit up, right? The other funny thing about this one is that it will actually be my first foray into anything that could be considered like home decor. I haven't done anything like that yet. And I don't know, there's something interesting about the idea of knitting something that will be on display in my home, not on my body. Interesting. I mean, not year round. I'm not making like permanent home decor here, but interesting. I like that idea. It's fun. Okay, my final concrete plan for this fall is mom's scarf. So if you recall earlier this year, I was on a trip to Venice when I popped into the local yarn store there called Lalabella and picked up this wild skein that my mom, who was with me, kept kind of wandering back to and being like, wow, this is so pretty. Wow, this would make a really nice scarf. Wow. Eventually I took the hint and I purchased it with the intention of knitting her some sort of scarf with it. And I think I need to start thinking about actually doing that because her birthday already passed in August. So Christmas is kind of the next time that makes sense. Now this is where, again, sorry family, some of you are gonna get better Christmas presents than others because I'm sure she will love this scarf. Is it as wildly ambitious a project as Kim's cardigan? No, so sorry mom, not this year. But I think this one, I am just going to sort of make up as I go. My plan is to just be knitting this flat, starting out with a narrow width, just do some increases as I go until it gets to some sort of rough scarf width so I have a nice taper on the end. And then just knit until I'm almost out and then just taper the other end down as well. Now, based on this very strange sort of bobbly yarn, I'm thinking that this is one that I want to knit on really large needles so that it's a sort of deliberately open gauge. And with that in mind, I'm hoping that means that I can get away with knitting this garter stitch and to not have it really look like garter stitch, but to just be mystery miscellaneous open weave fun texture scarf thing. This is what I'm hoping. I need to swatch it though. But in terms of material, this yarn is Alp Premier in the color of 420. And I lost my receipt from this, but I think it cost me about $30 Canadian for this skein. So this one is the biggest sort of question mark, just as far as like, what's it actually gonna look like? Is it gonna work out the way I think it's going to? There's definitely going to be some improvisation and probably some going back and changing things and trying a different thing along the way. So with that in mind, I should probably just kind of start this one soon as a back burner project because I'm hoping that once it's started, it's just going to be very sort of mindless anyway. Like I'll just be knitting a lot of length of scarf until I'm almost out of yarn. That will probably be a good one to have when other projects are sort of temporarily out of commission because of a mid project block or something like that. Okay, that is it for my concrete plans this year. So let's get into slightly dreaming category. Let's get into, I have so much more time on my hands than into category. Let's get into the maybes. So the first thing on my maybe list is another one by Sari Nordland. This is the Ballard Pullover. Now, again, cables. <laughs> Do you see a theme? Do you see that I have been missing something in the last several months in knitting my cardigan that goes on forever, in knitting my summer garments in plain stockinette and in two by two ribbing? Do you see that I'm craving texture? So this could be entirely too many cables for one season. I probably don't even have time to knit this anyway but look at it. Like this is definitely my personal runner up project as far as garments for myself. Because on that concrete list, only one of those things was a garment that I will wear, right? Two of them are gifts, one of them is home decor. So if I were knitting myself a second sweater this season, this one is very appealing to me. And I also really love it in the color that it's shown. I don't knit very many neutrals, but I can definitely see a place for the odd one in my wardrobe. And I think this would be so nice. So we'll see if this one ever makes it to the top of the heap. But for the record, this is a DK weight pattern, but if it's between a 59.75 inch and 61.75 inch bust, just depending on how much of the intended positive ease that you want. This one's also a drop shoulder construction. So again, we're seeing a lot of this right now. In terms of materials, I would have to figure out what I would want to knit this out of. So like I said, it is a DK weight. I do like the color it's shown in, but what kind of yarn do I go with for that? I think this would be really nice to use an undyed yarn for, something that comes in a natural gray sort of color. There is a sort of like homestead yarn producer place in Canada. What are they called? 
Longway Homestead, which is, I believe, in Manitoba. It's definitely in Canada. And they are really big proponents of the Canadian wool industry. They produce and process their own wool right there on their farm. And I know that they make some really beautiful undyed yarns. So maybe I need to kind of follow their release schedule for the next little bit and see if they're putting out anything that would be a good fit for this sweater. Because I've been interested in trying their yarn for a while, and then I did see them at Knit City Toronto, and their stuff was really nice in person too. They had a nice range of different bases, and I think that I could get something that feels really sort of satisfyingly sheepy wooly that would be really nice to use for this garment but i am just oh, i just want to touch this one i want to squish it like i just i really love the kind of structured delineation of the cables i think that it's a kind of unusual and modern take on a cabled garment and i just i want it i want to make it why 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 don't i have more knitting time in my life i just want to make everything that's not true i'm really picky i just want to knit the too many things that i still like despite being incredibly picky and only having a limited amount of time to knit in and budget there's also that all right the next thing on my maybe list is the lume sweater which is also by sorry nordland i you guys cables and sorry these are the two themes of this planning video i i make no apologies but here's the thing i have actually never done stranded color work i've done quite a bit of intarsia as you can see and i love doing fun things with colors in garments but i have not yet done stranded color work which feels wrong <laughs> but i think that i have struggled to find the one pattern that I want to be the first one that I do. I think I just have a sense that stranded color work is a lot of work. It's going to be a new technique that I've never done before. It also adds to the cost of a project because you're basically using twice as much yarn or sometimes even more depending on how many colors are in the stranded color work in a given row. So that racks up the project cost. And I think that I, I have this issue where when I look at stranded color work sweaters as a whole, particularly ones with just sort of a, an interesting yoke. I love them as a whole, like as a genre, I'm obsessed, but I really struggle to pick out one individual one. Like which one is the one that I want to make because I love them more as a collection than as an individual unit. So trying to pick one feels, it feels like I'm trying to pick one that encapsulates everything I ever love about stranded color work. It's the picky part of my brain being like, you must find the absolute perfect sort of prototypical stranded color work sweater. And I just haven't found that yet. I haven't found the one where I'm like, this is definitely the one that I must knit right now. And I think part of the reason that this pattern is still on my maybes list and it's not one of my concrete plans has not taken the place of the Colette pullover, for instance, is that I'm just still not entirely sure this is the one. I just don't know how to pick one when I just love all of them. Now, I think that this one has done a good job of warming its way more into my heart as a single sweater than most of the patterns that I've considered so far, but I'm just not like quite sold yet. But then I'm like, maybe you just need to get over that and knit one and then you can just knit another one, right? Like you can have a collection. <laughs> you don't have to have the one stranded color work sweater to end all stranded color work sweaters. So. I think at some point I just need to do stranded color work and get it over with. So will that be this fall? Maybe. Now, one thing this pattern has working for it is that it's knit in worsted weight. So it'll be a little bit quicker to knit up than the things that I've been used to knitting lately. So that would be a nice change. And this pattern also accommodates between a 60 and 61 inch bust, depending on how much of the intended positive ease that you want. Another thing this has going for it is that it is knit seamlessly top down in the round, which like I was saying before, yeah, you forgo some structure in the shoulders, but oh, what a wonderful knitting experience. I just love, I just love top down in the round. Like it's just such a simple, peaceful, uninterrupted knitting process and I just love it. The other problem that I have with stranded color work is that, oh God, now I have to figure out what colors I wanna use. <laughs> and that is definitely a case for doing some mock-ups. I did a while ago now make a video showing how I mock up knits before I make them to help me decide on things like color. So if you wanna see more about that, I will pop a link to that up here and in the description below. But yeah, I think I kind of just need to start tinkering with these pattern pictures and figure out what colors I want knits out of. And here's part of the problem. Do I want it to be high contrast like it is in the pattern photos? Do I wanna do something more low contrast with two bright colors? Do I wanna use the contrast color as an opportunity to use a fun variegated yarn, like something from Hedgehog Fibers? Though that does then mean that I think it would need to be high contrast. I think that if you're using variegated yarn in color work, it needs to be very, very far off from the color that you were contrasting it against for the pattern to not get lost amongst all the variegation. And should I really be buying more Hedgehog Fibers? Like it took me eons to figure out what I wanted to actually do with that one skein that I bought from them a million years ago. and finally 
finally just turned into my Teclo top. So I don't know, there's just so many possibilities for the Colorwork sweater. Like it's hard enough for me to choose one color that I want something to be. So to choose two and like what the relationship between those two colors should be, this is also why I haven't done that yet. It's just hard, it's hard being this picky. I was gonna say I want it to be perfect. Things aren't perfect, we're not supposed to try for perfect alley. I just want it to be perfect. Okay, next and final on our maybe list is the Chroma by Jacqueline Cheshlack. So this is a super fun color blocked pattern that is designed to accommodate up to between a 60 and a 66 inch bust, depending on how much of the recommended positive ease that you want. And just look how fun it is. It just brings me so much joy. I really love the color combinations used in these pattern photos, especially that like forest green and a lime green. I just love that color combination so much. But I also know that I would want to come up with my own color combination for this. I'd want it to be something that feels really special to me, which again, <laughs> Brings us back to our last problem with the Lume, where that means I now have a whole other decision to make. And it feels like a really big decision as someone who takes color palettes very seriously. Also, I blame my job for this. Like as a graphic designer, I have to put a lot of thought into color palettes. And I feel like that really haunts me here. But so this pattern is written for a worsted weight yarn, which again, is nice. It means it'll knit up nice and fast. This might be another case though, where I would maybe want to knit it out of something other than pure wool. I think this could be a really nice transitional garment as well. Maybe if I really like the cotton lino, maybe it's a case to, oh no, I was gonna say double up on the cotton lino, but then I remembered how expensive the cotton lino is. So that will not be happening, but something, something else that is a little bit less intense than 100% wool. Or, I mean, who knows? Maybe by the time I'm actually thinking about knitting this, I will be full on back to my desire to knit in nothing but wool. We will see. Construction wise, this one is a drop shoulder that is knit from the bottom up. So I guess you start in the round and then split to do the back and the front. And if you've been here before, you know I don't love a bottom up. You know that makes me a little bit uneasy. I just like to have more control than that over the length that things are, especially because like my row gauge is often not what a pattern is expecting it to be, even if I can match the stitch gauge. But I do feel like this one is kind of nice and oversized enough that it's probably fine. I can probably make it work. It will probably land within sort of the range of reason of the length of the garment for me. So I'm not too, too worried about that construction in this case. Also, can we just have a moment for the pocket? Like, look how cute it is. I also can't decide, like, I love the pockets when they're contrast pockets. This will not be a surprise if you've seen my quilted sweater jacket. Love a contrast pocket. But I also really love how it looks when it just matches the body. This is this is the problem. Again, too many, too many decisions to be made for this pattern. I, I don't know. This is on the maybe list because I just need to deliberate. Though contrast pockets could also be a really good use of some scrap yarn by like doubling up some leftover fingering weight or something like that. So that's, that's something I will consider, again, in my mock-ups because this is one that is just begging to be mocked up. Okay, that concludes our maybes. So now we are entirely in the realm of just like fantasy. Like there's no real world in which I'm knitting these things this fall, but you know what? It's fun to dream about what we might do if we had infinite time and resources, okay? And maybe these will make it into your concrete fall knitting plans. And in that way, they will really be deserving of being fall knitting plans. So let me know if you personally plan to graduate any of these from inspiration to reality. Now it might be tricky to do that on this first one though, because I'm confused. So the first pattern is El Naranjo and it doesn't like seem to really exist. So it has a page on Ravelry. This is how I found it. And then just today in prepping for this video, I was trying to find the details of the pattern, like how much does it cost? And there wasn't actually a pattern linked that I could buy. And in the description of it, there was a link to a kit for this pattern from the yarn store that I believe put it out. But when I clicked that link, it gave a 404 error. So like, has this pattern just been disappeared from the internet? Like, I'm not really sure what's going on with it. If you know where this pattern can be found, let me know. If you know just why it can't be found, also let me know. I'm just curious. But so this pattern is the El Naranjo by Claudia Quintanilla, and it is a beautiful, again, stranded colorwork sweater. So this is stranded colorwork number two that I'm thinking about. This pattern does include beaded details on it, which I personally would omit. I would just want to do the knit colorwork, but I just think it's so beautiful. I just love these really sort of like elegant dainty little like branchy details. Now the downside is that those elegant dainty little details are done in fingering weight yarn. So this would be a slow project. Like I have now as of this summer I believe for the first time knit using just fingering weight yarn but those have been summer garments. Those have been small things that like come down to here and don't have a back and don't have sleeves. So the idea of knitting that in a sweater's volume of garment Feels like a lot. I'm not sure if I'm at that stage yet. A DK weight is the smallest that I've knit for a full sweater garment so far, but it's just beautiful. So I was gonna say, I am thinking about it. 
I was thinking about it before I realized that there might not actually be a way to acquire this pattern. I don't know, I don't know what's happening with it, but it's pretty and I wanted to show you anyway. So here you go, look how pretty it is. And maybe not very relevant because I don't know if we can have it, but it does allegedly accommodate between a 59.5 inch bust to a 64.5 inch bust, which is a wonderful range if the pattern exists. Also, no one has logged any projects of it on Ravelry. So I guess I'm probably not the only person who can't figure out how to find a pattern for this. But also I don't know that I would want to knit something that doesn't have any projects I can look at on Ravelry because I feel like there is often just such a range in how your garment can turn out looking compared to the pattern photos, just depending on the differences of how we each individually knit things and just how we each individually look like how it fits our particular bodies so i really like to be able to look at a lot of different project photos and get a sense of the sort of average like how does it fit in the pattern photos but how does it fit most people who are wearing it because mine is more likely to end up somewhere in this soup than looking exactly like this so i try not to get too attached to a pattern's particular marketing photos but in this case that's all i have so I really need more information on this one, including how to knit it, like a pattern. So I, I don't know. The next one on this list is the Cargill Sweater by Rebecca Klo. Now this is a pattern that's been in my favorites for a long time. I could very much see this at some point graduating from inspiration to a maybe or a concrete plan. It just hasn't quite earned its way up there yet. But I do really love the texture that's created with this. I think it's like a drop stitch pattern. It just looks so nice and squishy. I wanna be all cozy in it. And it's also a DK weight. So this weight is a little more accessible to me to knit in. This is not foreign to me. I know that I can bring myself to do that. And it also makes it a really good candidate for a fingering weight mohair combo. And it just feels, given the sort of squishy look of it, that feels like a sweater that I don't want that to be in summer fibers. I want that to be warm. I want to put that on when I'm freezing. And I just want to feel the warmth descend on me like a cloud. And I think the sweater would be perfect for that. So this pattern costs seven Great British pounds or about 13 Canadian dollars. And it's designed to fit up to a between 64 to 66 inch bust. Now this one has an interesting construction. It is knit starting with just the back of the neck and then it is knit seamlessly top down in a raglan style. So basically it's just saving you having to do short rows by just knitting this little back of the neck and then you join in the round and keep going from there. And I like that. I like that as sort of a compromise to a traditional raglan structure. I think that's really nice. So yes, I do think that there could be a cargo sweater in my future at some point for real. It just hasn't quite made its way to the top of the heap yet. But I think that this would be one that would be really nice to do again in a fun color surprise prize. And I don't yet know what that fun color will be. Maybe it's knit in a yellow like my cardigan and that is how I use up the million yards of touch me mohair that I still have left over from that or maybe I knit it something entirely brand new that is nowhere yet in my knitwear collection but as just a one color garment that feels like a fun amount of room to play around with like just what what shade would I like to see in there I think that could be fun all right the last thing in our inspiration category is a brand new pattern release this is the gritty pattern by Jacqueline Cheshlack who also has made multiple appearances on this list now and this is very different from everything else on this list in that it is more of a borderline more of like a spring summer garment I do think it also definitely has a place in the fall or even just in more like warm indoor environments in the winter but it really stands out for not being like a sweater here right and this is one where I am obsessed with the pattern photos like I saw this pop up as a new pattern and I was like oh I haven't knit one of Jacqueline's patterns before and I was like, this is the one. I'm going to knit this, this is perfect. It's also stranded color work. Maybe this is what gets me into stranded color work. I was really pumped for it. And then I was looking at the project page and at other people's experiences with it and was starting to have some doubts. So currently, because it's so new, not a lot of people have knit it, obviously. There are test knitter entries on Ravelry, but multiple people commented on having fit issues that they're told has now been fixed in the updated pattern that's the one that's actually been released, but that that was not what they had the experience of knitting with. So it means that like, I don't really have a good sense of what I can expect fit wise. And when I look at the project photos of these test knitters, most of them feel to me like they fit very differently than the pattern photos. And the pattern photos are the fit that I love. Now it's possible that this means that I just need to knit a size or two up because I found that a lot of the test knitters tops just look much more sort of structured and closer to the body than the pattern photos that I love so much. So maybe I can remedy that by just knitting a few sizes up and making sure that I'm knitting out of something that's giving me a nice drape. But I'm also a bit hesitant to fix the fit of a garment by sizing up just in the way that I really care about size inclusivity in patterns. And if for me to have something that fits the way that I feel like it should fit, I have to go up three sizes. 
everybody at the upper end of that size range doesn't have that option, right? So that's the thing that I just like to be cognizant of. But also to be clear, I in no way mean that as a criticism of Jacqueline's pattern size inclusivity because they do a great job of that in their patterns. This pattern accommodates between a 57.75 to 61.75 inch bust, just depending on how much of the recommended positive ease that you want. And many of their patterns also go several inches further than that. So I'm really curious to see how these fit issues that were identified by the test knitters have been factored into that pattern. But unfortunately for me to see that, I just kind of have to wait for other people to knit it. <laughs> I just kind of have to wait and see what that Ravelry project page looks like a few months from now, I think. I, I think I just kind of need to wait for other people to be my guinea pig and see what happens because I love the idea of this pattern so much. I feel like this would be such a just sort of like cute top addition to the wardrobe. You know, an opportunity to wear my knits that's not just like it's really cold outside and I need a sweater, but I just need a little bit more confidence that it's gonna turn out the way that I would like it to before I bite the bullet and start. So if you would like to be that guinea pig for me, please do, by all means, thank you so much. This is another one where I would really have to think a lot about colors because on the one hand, really love the high contrast look of the pattern photos. On the other hand, could I envision doing this in sort of a pastel-y color scheme? maybe a bright version of a color plus a pastel version of that same color. Like I could really imagine some really beautiful lower contrast but bright color versions of this. I could also imagine a really beautiful low contrast neutral, right? What if it's sort of like cream with like a sort of light brown or light gray stripe? There's just too many possibilities with color work. Do you see my problem? In terms of the pattern itself, this is a $10 US or about $14 Canadian. And like Jacqueline's other pattern that I mentioned, this is a bottom up seamless drop shoulder construction. So again, the bottom up of it all makes me a little bit nervous. But again, given the positive ease of it all, I'm, I'm hopeful that it would be okay. I would need to be careful on my row gauge. This might be a thing where I need to knit more rows before anything splits off which would also be funny because in this case it would mean that I would have to knit more rows before doing the like horizontal stripes so that my grid actually looks like squares and not rectangles. So that's just something to think about. But this is also knit in fingering weight and it's not a whole sweater, but it's definitely more surface area, particularly given the oversized nature of it than I have ever knit in fingering weight before. So it would also be a definite undertaking in that regard combined with the strained color work. It's just a lot. So this is why I kind of feel like I need a little bit more of a sample size before I commit to this one. All right, that is it for my fall knitting plans. Everything from concrete plans to maybes to almost definitely not, but like it's nice to have some inspo, right? And now, you know what, I've, I've got time. Let's do some off the needles. So this is my segment where I talk about creative things that are not knitting, and usually that involves books. And today it definitely involves books. So first up in finished objects, we have Slow Dance by Rainbow Rowell. And in my last video, I was talking about my general love of Rainbow Rowell's books, and I was about halfway through this one and really invested in it, and I really enjoyed this. This one for me wasn't a total five-star read like a lot of her books have been, but thoroughly enjoyed it, had a good time, would recommend probably just more of a four-star than a five-star read for me, but solid. So in case you haven't seen me talk about this one before, this is an adult contemporary book about two high school friends who haven't been in touch in a really long time but get reconnected at a mutual friend's wedding and it sort of reignites this will they or won't they romance that was sort of brewing in their teenage years. And I just really love these characters. I was just really invested in them. So would recommend. I was kind of speculating last time about the genre of this. I don't think this would be considered an actual romance. I think to me this felt more like just an adult contemporary book that was centered around a relationship, but it had a very different vibe to me than, for example, The Summer Will Be Different from Carly Fortune, which I read earlier this summer. So if like actual genre romance isn't your thing, this one might be a little bit more your speed. Okay, in terms of reading whips, like I don't have a lot to report. I'm still reading Lies and Weddings by Kevin Kwan, but I think I'm only 20 pages further than last time, and don't read into that. It's not its fault. You know whose fault it is? Love Island USA. Because I... <laughs> I've never watched Love Island. I'm deep in the Bachelor franchise. I love Love is Blind. We can also blame Love is Blind UK. There's just been so much TV that I've been so obsessed with in the last couple of weeks that I have just not been reading. I've been knitting and watching questionable dating reality TV shows and I've been so happy about it. So poor Kevin has taken a bit of a backseat for the time being. So I'll be back to this soon when I'm done loving terrible television. I do, however, have the new acquisition that last time I mentioned was like literally out for delivery, could land on my porch at any moment while I was last recording. And that is The Pairing by Casey McQuiston. So if that name sounds familiar, you may know Casey as the author of Red, White, and Royal Blue, which has also since been adapted into a movie. They also have two other books out since then called One Last Stop and I Kissed Shara Wheeler. 
And I just love Casey's writing. It's just so sharp and witty and fun and playful. And I just always have an absolute blast reading their books. So I'm really excited to get into the pairing because to me, Casey has a solid track record. Also look at the art on the edge of the book. Look how cute this is. I love details like that in a book. So the tag on this one is some things taste better together. And the premise of this book is wild and I'm so here for it is that this couple has broken up and years later, they both decided at the exact same time to use this voucher that they had acquired together and never used to go on a European trip. And they've both sort of decided to do this as a fun, like solo adventure. Like why not? Why shouldn't I go on this trip even though they're not going with me? And so of course this is what reunites them and starts what I, this is a romance, right? I think. So this just sounds like it's going to be like absurd, silly, wonderful, great time. Looking forward to it. All right, that's all I've got for you today. So thank you so much for coming in with me. If you'd like to be here next time, please do consider subscribing if you're not already. If you are already subscribed, you're my favorite. And if you're in the US, please, please, please make sure you're registered to vote, okay? As a Canadian, as a neighbor to your north, everything that happens in the US trickles up here and I don't get to vote on it. And it really stresses me out. And if come November, this channel suddenly goes dark, it will be because Trump was elected and I lost all will to do anything. So just please, 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 please make sure you're registered to vote. Make a plan to vote. Please go vote. Thank you. I'll catch you next time. Bye.